Praise the Lord. It is good to uh, be with you again. This is my second time here in Dallas at the conference. I am very honored to have been invited to, to speak um, on behalf of the pre-trib study group. Um, my home fellowship is just outside Manchester in a town called Stockport in Cheshire, which is in the north of England. It's called Hazel Grove Full Gospel Church. I am the associate minister. And all my brothers and sisters back home right now are gathering in their homes to pray for you, pray for you all. I was going to say pray for you all. Pray for you all. <laughs> it's rubbing off already. I've only been here three days. <laughs> But I'm here on behalf of my brothers and sisters back home, on behalf of my pastor, Andrew Robinson, and his wife, Pat, um, who I am very indebted to and would not be here, but for what the Lord Jesus has done through them in my life. And it is our prayer, not just my prayer this morning, but our prayer that the Lord Jesus would bless each and every one of you, my brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, bless you richly, and may the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts during this conference be pleasing to him. The second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ is at hand. The heavenly bridegroom is returning for his bride. The Father's house is ready. The marriage supper of the Lamb is prepared. Perhaps today, even so, come Lord Jesus. On October the 4th, 1831, 35 clergymen and 15 laypeople gathered at the country estate of Lady Theodosia Powers Court in the small Irish village of Ennis Kerry outside Dublin. All who assembled for the first Powers Court conference on biblical prophecy were distressed at the condition of the church and convinced that the hope of Christ's return should figure more prominently in the thinking of Christians. Few could have imagined then how great an impact this and subsequent Powers Court conferences would have on the wider church. The inspiration behind these conferences, which enabled the pioneers of the Plymouth Brethren movement to develop a more coherent understanding of prophecy, may have been Lady Theodosia's attendance at the first Aubrey Park Conference in Surrey, England in 1826. There, 30 of the most eminent premillennialist scholars and clergymen of the day had gathered for the inaugural conference at the home of Henry Drummond to discuss the great prophetic questions which most instantly concern Christendom. These included the times of the Gentiles, the present and future condition of the Jews, and the future advent of the Lord. Five annual conferences were held in total, concluding in 1830. According to Drummond's account, the majority of what was called the religious world disbelieved that the Jews were to be restored to their own land and that the Lord Jesus Christ was to return and reign in person on this earth. The undoubted success of the Albury Conferences was that they brought together men of like heart and mind who were fully persuaded that Israel was to be restored nationally and that Christ was to return in person to establish his thousand-year reign on earth. Men like Henry Drummond, William Cunningham, Alexander Haldane, Spencer Percival Jr., Hugh McNeil, William Millennial Marsh, and Edward Irving were given a broader platform from which to disseminate their premillennial beliefs. The one notable failure of the Albury Conferences, however, was their endorsement of historicism, which maintained that the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation had largely been fulfilled and that the prophetic days, weeks, months and years were not to be interpreted literally. Historicism had been a regrettable legacy of the Protestant Reformation, which confused the church's position in inheritance with that of Israel, veiled the doctrine of the any moment rapture of the church, muted the midnight cry, and robbed generations of believers of the present blessedness of the blessed hope. In October 1831, against the backdrop of the Wicklow Mountains outside Dublin, a new dawn began to break. One man in particular stepped forward in the sovereign purposes of God 
to help lighten the darkness, dispel the confusion, and chart a clear course for the church in readiness for Christ's return. The name of this uncompromising champion for Christ's glory and God's truth was John Nelson Darby. John Nelson Darby was born in Westminster, London on November the 18th, 1800. His father was the English merchant John Darby, and his mother was Anne Vaughan, the daughter of Samuel Vaughan, a sugar plantation owner from Philadelphia who was an acquaintance of George Washington and a vice president of the American Philosophical Society, which was founded by Benjamin Franklin in 1743. Darby's parents were married in New York on the 20th of July, 1784. His uncle, Benjamin Vaughan, was a close friend of Franklin and a peace negotiator at the close of the War of Independence in 1782-83. Another uncle was British Admiral Sir Henry Destair Darby, who fought under Admiral Lord Nelson against Napoleon's fleet at the Battle of the Nile in 1798. Darby was given his middle name in honor of Lord Nelson, who was his godfather. After graduating in the classics from Trinity College Dublin in 1819, Darby trained as a barrister. Much to his father's displeasure, however, he chose instead the path to ordination in the Church of Ireland, a decision which cost him his inheritance. But as he later explained, I was a lawyer. But feeling that if the Son of God gave himself for me, I owed myself entirely to him, and that the so-called Christian world was characterized by deep ingratitude towards him, I longed for complete devotedness to the work of the Lord. My chief thought was to get round amongst the poor Catholics of Ireland. As a curate, Darby labored tirelessly in the harsh terrain of the Wicklow Mountains, ministering to the needs of Christ's flock while preaching the gospel to the Roman Catholic peasants. In 1827, he recalled how these Catholic peasants had been converting at the rate of 600 to 800 a week before the Church of Ireland imposed upon all converts an oath of allegiance and supremacy to the Protestant faith and the British government. This great harvest of souls came to an abrupt end by which time Darby's health had deteriorated. As Francis William Newman, brother of Cardinal John Henry Newman, and an acquaintance of Darby recounted, every evening Darby sallied forth to teach in the cabins, and roving far and wide over mountain and amid bogs, was seldom home before midnight. By such exertions his strength was undermined, and he so suffered in his limbs that not lameness only, but yet more serious results were feared. He did not fast on purpose, but his long walks through wild country inflicted on him much severe deprivation. Moreover, as he ate whatever food offered itself, food unpalatable and often indigestible to him, his whole frame might have vied in emaciation with a monk of Latrape. Such a phenomenon intensely excited the poor Romanists, who looked on him as a genuine saint of the ancient breed. That a dozen such men would have done more to convert all Ireland to Protestantism than the whole apparatus of the church establishment was ere long my conviction. Newman described Darby as a most remarkable man and has left us with one of the most evocative portraits of the man he nicknamed the Irish clergyman. His bodily presence was indeed weak. A fallen cheek, a bloodshot eye, crippled limbs resting on crutches, a seldom shaven beard, a shabby suit of clothes, and a generally neglected person drew at first pity with wonder to see such a figure in a drawing room. It was currently reported that a person in Limerick offered him a halfpenny, mistaking him for a beggar. With keen logical powers, he had warm sympathies, solid judgment of character, thoughtful tenderness, and total self-abandonment. A serious horse riding accident in October 1827 dramatically altered the course of Darby's life. According to his own testimony, it was during his three-month convalescence in Dublin that he devoted himself to the serious study of the scriptures, 
and made two important discoveries. First, that the Christian having his place in Christ in heaven has nothing to wait for save the coming of the Savior. And second, that according to Isaiah 32, there was still an economy or dispensation to come when Christ would reign as king upon the earth. Darby's life and ministry would never be the same again. In 1840, <clears throat> Darby observed what many of you here today have been researching, writing, and preaching about for many years. He wrote, All nations have their attention occupied about Jerusalem, Zechariah 12:3, and know not what to do about it. We do not mean that all this yet comes out plain, but the principles which are found in the Word of God <clears throat> are acting in the midst of the kingdoms when the, where the ten horns are to appear. That is, we find all Western Europe occupied about Jerusalem and preparing for war, <clears throat> and Russia on her side preparing herself and exercising influence over the countries given to her in the word. And all the thoughts of the politicians of this world concentrate themselves on the scene where their final gathering in the presence of the judgment of God will take place. In 1848, precisely 100 years before the establishment of the modern state of Israel, Darby published his studies on the book of Daniel. He wrote, As far as the world is concerned, Jerusalem is nothing. It is a city trodden down, with neither commerce nor riches nor aught else. It is true indeed that the kings of the earth are beginning to look that way because providence is leading in that direction. But as for God, he ever thinks of it. It is always his house, his city. His eyes and his heart are there continually. Now faith understands this. <coughs> Darby understood this because his faith was rooted and anchored in the one who remembers his covenant forever, the word he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant he made with Abraham, the oath he swore to Isaac, Psalm 105, verses 8 to 9. Christ's atoning sacrifice at Calvary had, according to Darby, secured the sure mercies of David and guaranteed the fulfillment of all the promises made to Israel. As he stated in his exposition of Romans 11, 25 to 32, God's covenant to take away Israel's sins is sure. It shall be accomplished when Christ comes. For, note, the apostle speaks of Christ in Zion in a time yet to come. The final restoration of Israel will be on the ground of the promises made to the fathers, for his mercy endureth forever. Darby understood the importance of Paul's words in Romans 9, 4 to 5. Theirs is the adoption as sons. Theirs the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. God's faithfulness to his name, to his covenants, and to his people guaranteed Israel's national future. This cardinal truth had been obscured for centuries by amillennial and postmillennial teaching, which had served to rob the people of Israel of their promised inheritance, the Messiah of Israel of his earthly throne, and the God of Israel of his future glory. As Darby emphatically declared in 1850, Israel is always the people of God. Israel cannot cease to be the people of God. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance, and it is of Israel that this is said. God never ceases to consider Israel as his people, but he has ceased to govern them as his people, and to have his throne in the midst of them upon the earth. In all times, Israel is his people, according to his counsels and the thoughts of his love. This does not prevent their being called Loami, 
not my people, as to the government of God. This was no new revelation. It was the word of God. As the Lord himself had declared through his prophet Jeremiah, Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, says the Lord, then shall the descendants of Israel cease from being a nation before me forever. Jeremiah 31, 35 to 36. For thus says the Lord, just as I have brought all this great calamity upon this people, so I will bring upon them all the good that I have promised them. Jeremiah 32, verse 42. God said what he meant and meant what he said. By interpreting biblical prophecy in its plain, literal, and common sense, Darby dealt a hammer blow to Augustinian allegorism, amillennialism, and supersessionism, which had blighted the church for centuries. He could not, however, have foreseen the impact his faithful exposition of God's word would have many years later when the people of Israel entered their darkest night. In 1942 43, Approximately 5,000 Jewish refugees found sanctuary in the homes of villages in the remote mountain village of Le Chambon in southeastern France. Among the villagers were Plymouth Brethren, in French, Dabistes, who, according to Jewish author Philip Halley, sheltered Jewish refugees from the Nazis because of the special sympathy they had for God's chosen people. As Halley explains, Believing that every word of the Bible was inspired by God, the Darbist had a thorough knowledge of the history of the Jews as that history is told in the Old Testament. On one occasion, a German Jewish lady came to buy eggs from one of their farms. The farmer's wife invited her into the kitchen before asking, You, you are Jewish? The lady stepped back, trembling, and became even more frightened when the farmer's wife called to her family to come down immediately. Hallie records what happened next. Rooted to the spot in fear, her fright disappeared when the woman added, while her family was coming down the steps, Look, look, my family. We have in our house now a representative of the chosen people. It is a fitting tribute not only to the Chambonnet villagers, but also to John Nelson Darby himself that these righteous acts have been recognized by the Department for the Righteous Among the Nations at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem and described by its former director, Mordecai Paldiel, as probably the most celebrated case of Christian charity in the history of the Holocaust. David Brogg offers his analysis of what transpired at Le Chambon. In rejecting replacement theology, Darby laid the groundwork for a far more philo-Semitic Christianity. Dispensationalism restored to the Jews the divine mission and divine love that replacement theology had stripped away. In so doing, dispensationalism provided a very different instruction to individual Christians about how they should relate to the Jews living among them. If God never rejected the Jews but still held them dear, then it followed logically and emotionally that man should do the same. Darby's interest in Israel was not an end in itself. He understood that the supreme focus of Scripture was not the salvation of mankind or the return of the Jewish people to their land or even the catching away of the church to be with Christ in the air, as vital as these things were. The supreme focus was the glory of of God. As Darby explained, first, the thoughts of God are upon the glory of Christ, who on his reappearance will reign over the earth. Secondly, the Jews are the habitual object of the thoughts of God and will by and by be reestablished in all their privileges. In this way, then, Darby set Israel in a proper theological and eschatological context while at the same time, and as a matter of priority, directing the eye of the believer to the coming of the Lord. 
This is Christian Zionism. Darby understood what many even today fail to understand or stubbornly refuse to acknowledge. Namely, that the expectation of Christ's return had ruled the intelligence, sustained the hope, and inspired the conduct of the apostles. The spiritual decline of the church owed much, he believed, to the loss of this expectation. In his Reflections upon the Prophetic Enquiry, published in 1829, Darby observed how, in every New Testament letter, the coming of the Lord Jesus is made the prominent object of the faith and hope of believers. He drew particular inspiration from the example of the early Thessalonians who had turned to God from idols to wait for his son from heaven. 1 Thessalonians 1, 9-10. He understood that the church was now seated in Christ in heavenly realms with nothing to wait for except Christ himself. How then could the church be destined for the time of God's judgment upon the earth, as many were teaching? How could those who had been purchased by God and freed from their sins through the blood of the Lamb now be made subject to the wrath of the Lamb? Hadn't Jesus delivered repentant sinners from the wrath to come through his death on the cross? Hadn't his atoning sacrifice been sufficient to consecrate and purify a people and a bride for himself before the great tribulation? How could an end times church be given a mandate that the church of nearly two millennia had not been given? Many had confused the church's own position and destiny, not only with that of Israel, but also with those who would be redeemed during the Great Tribulation. Darby, on the other hand, understood what the Apostle Paul had taught the Thessalonians. Darby wrote, A most extraordinary thing to do waiting for God's Son. That is, all our hopes are clean out of this world. Do not expect anything from earth, but look for something from heaven, and this God's Son Himself, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Those who were looking for Christ were entirely delivered from the wrath to come. This gives a very distinct position to the Christian. Here is the historical fact of wrath past. At Christ's first coming, he had taken up the whole question of wrath. All the question is totally and finally settled. Sin is born once, and he who bore it is raised from the dead. This sets me in perfect freedom, and it does more because it links me up with Christ in heaven. I know he is coming. Why? because I know him there. This divine person before my soul, this Christ, the man who infinitely interested about my sins died for me, he is waiting in heaven. We are waiting, our bodies to be raised when we are to see him and be like him. We are really waiting for something. For what? For the person who has so loved us government under Christ is going to be set up. All things are to be put under his feet. I shall be happy long before that. We love his appearing, but we love himself better. Therefore, we wait for him to take us to himself. I cannot be waiting for God's Son from heaven if I am expecting wrath. Suppose God said tonight, would you say, this is what I want. If not, there is something between your affections and Christ. The problem which had beset many in the church was not so much the denial of the Lord's coming, but the loss of the sense and present expectation of it. The teaching that Jesus could not come for his bride until certain prophetic events had taken place had forced the church into prophecies relating to the time of Jacob's trouble a time clearly identified with Daniel's people. Jeremiah 37, Daniel 12, 1, Matthew 24, 21. As Darby remarked, the Lord considers it important that the saints should be always expecting his return as a present thing and wishing for it as a present thing. And indeed, were I to adopt the system proposed to me, post-tribulationism, 
I should not expect the Lord at all until a time when I was able to fix the day of his appearing. I say fix the day, for I cannot expect his coming until the abomination of desolation is set up at Jerusalem. And then I can say, now, in 1260 days the Lord will be here. And this fixing by signs and dates, I am told, is the sober way of waiting But it is quite clear that it is contrary to the way the Lord himself has taught me to expect him. It is clear that if these signs are to be expected for the church, I have nothing to expect till they are fulfilled. I may expect them and have my mind fixed on them, but not on Christ's coming. And when one particular one happens, I can name to a day his coming. This is not what Christ has taught me. And therefore, I do not receive it. Darby made one final and crucial observation. If the bride has got the sense of being the bride of Christ, she must desire to be with the bridegroom. There is no proper love to Christ unless she wants to be with him. In 1857, Darby expressed his delight that the doctrines of the rapture of the church and the restoration of Israel were attracting the attention of many Christians. Though much opposition had arisen, this was to be welcomed, for he believed it would encourage serious Christians to examine God's word afresh. Controversy and conflict accompanied Darby wherever he went, but his love for the church, including those he could not fellowship with, remained undiminished. The most striking example of this is the response he wrote to Francis William Newman following the publication of Newman's work, Phases of Faith. It was Newman who had invited Darby to speak at Oxford University in 1830, which led to the formal establishment of the Plymouth Brethren. Although Darby had no thought of sparing Newman's work because of its heterodoxy, it drew from him somewhat different feelings because of his close acquaintance with the author. As Darby said to Newman in his response, if the book is a guilty one, its author is guilty of it. But there is another feeling arises as to the author, which does not as to the book. To the book I can measure out without a pang unmingled feelings of disgust and contempt. To the author I could not. The thought of him awakens sorrow, regret, pain. I do mourn. But I write that you may at least feel that my attacking your book is as far as possible from bitterness toward you. May the Lord, who alone has power to blot out and overcome our wretchedness and new create the heart, make you, as in other ways he has me, a monument of his almighty and infinite grace. Though many questioned his approach to church discipline, Darby's conscience was clear. Echoing the sentiment expressed by the Apostle Paul in his second letter to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 11 verse 2, Darby wrote, The one desire of my heart is the beauty and blessing of the church, the bride of Christ. That will make me earnestly love all saints, for they are of it. I desire its entire separation to Christ, to whom she belongs, espoused as a chaste virgin, my feet in the narrow way, my heart as large as Christ's. In a letter to his dear friend, John Gifford Bellet, Darby declared that, while specially happy in evangelizing, my heart ever turns to the churches being fit for Christ. My heart turns there. It was Darby's love for the church which took him across the Atlantic for the first time in 1862. His purpose was to strengthen the French and Swiss brethren who were struggling out in the prairies. Little did he realize then that he would tour North America seven times during the course of the next 15 years. In 1863, Darby traveled on the skirts of the American Civil War and recalled in a letter that he had traveled about 2,000 miles in the last four weeks, some achievement by 1863 standards. In a letter written in 1866, he summed up the spiritual condition of the United States in one word, 
frightful. Though Darby found the American church more worldly than anywhere you would find it, his heart became greatly knit to the states and God's people there. The cities he visited most frequently were Chicago, St. Louis, Boston, and New York. But wherever he went, his mission objective remained the same, to present Christ and the truth, accomplished salvation, and his coming. In a letter from New York in 1867, he expressed great joy at the progress being made. The Lord's coming is planted in many souls, he wrote. The cloud is not bigger than a man's hand, but I believe there is unequivocal blessing. Dwight Lyman Moody, James Hall Brooks, Adoniram Judson Gordon, Cyrus Ingerson Schofield, William Eugene Blackstone, and Arno Clemens Gabelin. Seven of the founding fathers of American dispensationalism who took up Darby's mantle and sounded the midnight cry loud and clear across the United States during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Their names are, I am sure, greatly admired by many in this room today. Let us briefly now consider the formative and enduring influence Darby and his eschatology had upon each one of them. Moody. Moody has been described as the most influential clergyman in America. Moody spent considerable time among the Plymouth Brethren and invited many of them, including Darby, to preach in his Illinois Street Church in Chicago. Moody was inspired by Darby's uncompromising belief in the imminent bodily and premillennial return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Darby wrote of him, I know the man well. And in 1876, Darby rejoiced that Moody had greatly got on in truth. Moody became a patron of dispensationalism. Brooks. Brooks was the Presbyterian minister in St. Louis who discipled Cyrus Schofield. Brooks was the founding father and president of the Niagara Bible Conference, or the Believers Meeting for Bible Study, which helped spread dispensationalism across America. Brooks described Darby and the Brethren as a people who are, on the whole, the soundest in faith and most intelligent in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Brooks also recalled how he had often heard with great pleasure and profit Mr. Darby, who preached in his church in St. Louis at various times. Gordon. Gordon was the pastor of Clarendon Street Baptist Church in Boston, who inspired D.L. Moody to accept dispensationalism. Gordon was one of the leaders of the Bible and Prophecy Conference movement, and Gordon paid the following tribute to Darby and the Brethren. He said this, It demands a fearless candor to concede it, but we believe that, we believe that truth requires us to confess that we owe a great debt, both in literature and in life, to the leaders of this ultra-Protestant movement. Schofield. Schofield pastored the first Congregational Church of Dallas and later Moody's Church in East Northfield, Massachusetts. Schofield's Bible Correspondence School course of study in 1890 was used by Moody Bible Institute to promote dispensationalism around the world. Schofield popularized dispensationalism on an unprecedented scale through his reference Bible of 1909. According to Schofield's research assistant, Miss Emily Farmer, the two sets of reference books on Dr. Schofield's desk, to which he referred constantly, were the synopsis of the books of the Bible by J. N. Darby and the numerical Bible by F. W. Grant. Blackstone. Blackstone was the founder of the Chicago Hebrew Mission, today Life in Messiah International, Blackstone was the author of Jesus is Coming, first published in 1878, which became America's first dispensationalist bestseller. Blackstone presented his famous petition on behalf of European Jewry, known as the Blackstone Memorial, to President Benjamin Harrison in 1891. In 1917, it was represented to President Woodrow Wilson, who approved the Balfour Declaration shortly after. 
When Theodore Herzl, the leader of the Zionist movement, was looking for a viable homeland for the Jewish people, Blackstone showed him why there could only ever be one homeland for the Jews. By sending Herzl a Bible with all the prophecies relating to the land of Israel clearly marked. Blackstone was described by first Jewish Supreme Court Justice Louis D. Brandeis as the father of Zionism. And in 1956, Israel named a forest in his honor. Blackstone was undoubtedly influenced by Darby's eschatology. Gabelin. Gabelin was a German Jewish immigrant who founded the Hope of Israel mission in New York. He helped Schofield compile his reference Bible, and Lewis Sperry Chafer established the Evangelical Theological College here in Dallas, today Dallas Theological Seminary. Gabelin wrote, I found in Darby's writings the soul food I needed. Gabelin described Darby as the most outstanding among the mighty men of God of the Plymouth Brethren and one of the most eminent scholars who ever lived and possessed insight in the Word of God, which made him one of the greatest gifts the Lord ever gave to his church. And yet he was a very humble man. As E. Shuler English declared in a 1943 edition of Our Hope magazine, the best friend that the Jew has is the Christian who knows God's word, his love for his chosen people, and their place in the prophetic plan. These men were friends of the Jewish people. Darby left the United States in 1877, never to return. By then, 88 regular Brethren Bible reading meetings had been established. Darby's considerable legacy, however, is perhaps best expressed in terms of the sheer momentum the Lord generated through his ministry, which was carried forward by the American Bible and Prophecy Conference movement for years to come. In his final letter from America, dated June 1877, Darby made the following observation. The truth is spreading. For some time the coming of the Lord has wrought in souls far and wide, and the doctrine is spreading wonderfully. In 1881, after a fall in Dundee, Scotland, Darby's heart and lungs began to fail. A paralytic stroke soon followed, leaving him unable to walk without assistance. During his final days, many brethren gathered at his bedside. On one occasion, Darby told them, Well, it will be strange to find myself in heaven, but it won't be a strange Christ, one I have known these many years. How little I know of him. I am glad he knows me. Two weeks later, the dear servant fell asleep. With the quietness and peace that had characterized him in his long and devoted life, he had said on the previous Thursday, I feel like a bird ready to fly away. And on the following Saturday, the 29th of April, 1882, at 11.05 a.m., in the presence of all in the house standing around his bed, he departed to be with Christ. In his final letter, read out before his funeral, which was attended by upwards of a thousand people, Darby urged his beloved brethren to be ever watching and waiting for Christ. The graveside service began with the hymn, O happy morn, the Lord will come. Mr. C. Stanley then read from Matthew's account of Christ's burial and those who despaired at his death before declaring with great conviction. But we are here around the servant's grave with knowledge that the Master has risen, that he is with us here in our sorrow, and that he is coming soon to take us all to be with himself in heaven. How could we possibly have come here to lay this loved one in the grave with confidence did we not know the blessed hope of resurrection? One name only of all who have walked this earth is worthy here to be remembered and spoken of, even he who has annulled death, and who will, we know not how soon, call forth from the tomb the bodies of his sleeping saints and take up his living ones to be with himself forever. We place the body of our beloved brother in this grave with this our blessed hope to comfort and cheer our sorrowing hearts. The hymn, Soon Thou Wilt Come Again, 
was then sung before Mr. Stanley read John 14, 1 to 3, and 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 to 18. He then paid the following tribute to John Nelson Darby. The precious truths contained in these and other scriptures have now become familiar to thousands and perhaps tens of thousands in the church of God. But some of us around this grave may be able to look back and remember the time when these distinctive truths were forgotten and unknown. Yes, we can remember a time when there was not a person in the various districts from which we have gathered today that knew the blessed truth of the coming of the Lord to take his church or the abiding presence of the Holy Ghost on earth. He would acknowledge in the presence of our God, in the presence of death, as we commit this precious body to the Lord's care in this grave, the great goodness of our God and Father in using our beloved departed brother as his vessel to restore these and other blessed truths to the church. Let our prayer be that the Lord may use his death to our blessing and his writings more largely to the rich blessing of the entire church of God. Mr. Stanley then prayed that the coming of the Lord as the immediate hope of believers, which our departed brother had under God's hand been, been the means of reviving, might more than ever be a living and operative truth in our souls. All of us here today would, I'm sure, amen his prayer. The hymn, Lord Jesus, Come, was then sung as Darby's body was lowered into the grave. Asleep in Jesus, John Nelson Darby awaits with us today the great cry of command, the archangel's call, and the sound of the trumpet of God. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. The Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all the saints. Amen. Well, I would like to conclude my paper this morning by introducing something to you, which is a gift. And it's a gift from myself. It's a gift from my pastor, Andrew Robinson. It's a gift from my church, Hazel Grove for Gospel Church, back there in Stockport in the north of England. And it's a song. And this is a song that the Lord put into the heart of my pastor a few months ago, a song about the coming of the Lord. It's a song that has greatly blessed and encouraged each one of us. We are about 80 adults, uh, maybe 20 children. We love the Lord Jesus. We love one another. We have our struggles, as all believers do. But the Lord has been so gracious and so good to us. And it is just astonishing how the Lord can use the small and the weak and the feeble for his glory. This is a song that we're going to play in a, in a moment or two that we pray will be of rich blessing to each and every one of you. As a church, we belong to what's called the Fellowship of Christian Assemblies, which, as the title suggests, is a fellowship of small Christian fellowships around the UK. And when I say small, I mean twos and threes down in the south of England, a dozen up in the north of England, a few who meet in homes in the middle of Wales. And we seek to support brothers and sisters in Christ who have nowhere to go. And there are many of them in Britain, scattered, if you like, on the hills of England with no shepherd, no pastor who cares enough to feed these members of Christ's flock. My pastor Andrew is the, the leader of FCA along with another brother, Doug, down in uh, Plymouth in the south of England. And it's our, it's our heart's desire, because it's the desire of the Lord's heart, to gather in his flock. The Lord's flock, the church, the bride is so precious and so dear to him. And this song really encapsulates, don't worry, I'm not going to sing it, it's going to be played to you. But this song encapsulates everything that we believe. And this was recorded. What you're going to hear now is a recording. I'm going to take you for the next four minutes over the Atlantic to Stockport, Cheshire,
to Hazel Grove for Gospel Church. You're going to join us in our morning service as we sing this song of praise to the Lord and proclaim the good news of his any moment appearing. We are not a large church. We are not professional. We don't have a choir. We don't have professional musicians. Um, Andrew had the song from the Lord. Graham is our music leader, and he put it to music. You're going to hear Paul on the keyboard. You're going to hear Wendy and Amy playing the trumpets. You're even going to hear two-year-old Lydia crying out to her mother as we sing this song <laughs> from, the, from the lips of infants and babes you have ordained praise. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. And may the Lord Jesus just bless each and every one of you. Any questions? Questions here? Raise your hand and we will.
try to get the microphone to you. This uh, amazing presentation ends with a song and everything. A tremendous content in that song. Uh, we come down the aisle here. Okay. Um, I'm involved in a lot of discussions, and I have an answer to this that I use, but I'd like to hear your answer just so I could use some of your <laughs> uh, thoughts. But uh, we have a lot of problems with people talking about replacement theology. In what sense does a church, have they replaced Israel, and what sense haven't they? I don't believe in any sense the church has replaced Israel. Uh, the Apostle Paul speaks there in Romans 9 to 11 very clearly about the olive tree and about being grafted, being grafted into the olive tree um, and then giving that warning to the church, to the, the Gentile believer, believers in particular there in Rome, do not be arrogant against the roots which support you. So the church doesn't replace in any sense the nation of Israel, um, Jew and Gentile now through the, the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, through his amazing grace, and now one in Christ and make up the body of Christ, make up the church. But Israel remains a nation in the, in the will and purpose and in the heart of God. And though they may be set aside for a time, and uh, Darby mentioned about the Lord not governing upon the earth through Israel anymore, at this present moment in time, one day he will, when the Lord Jesus returns to this earth, he will reestablish or restore the kingdom to Israel, which, if you remember, was that final question the disciples asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? A perfectly um, reasonable question to ask, having spent 40 days with the Lord, who taught them about the kingdom of God, the final question they ask is, Lord, now are you to restore the kingdom? And Jesus didn't say, no, the church is now the kingdom. He said simply, it's not for you to know the times and seasons set by my Father's authority. Basically affirming that their question was the right one, that Israel would be restored because God was faithful to all his covenant promises, but their priority now was to proclaim the gospel to the ends of the earth, to be witnesses for Jesus, and that the Father in his own time would restore the kingdom to Israel when his son would return and take up David's throne upon the earth. So we see tremendous continuity from the old to the new. Yes, the new covenant has superseded the old covenant, the Mosaic covenant, but the new covenant simply builds on the covenant with Abraham and the covenant with David. Uh, so in no sense has the church replaced Two peoples of God, connected through the Lord Jesus Christ, serving distinct purposes in the, in the, in the purpose and plan of God. Uh, would it be possible to get the music for that song? Yes. Um, on the table outside, I've, uh, or my church has produced a CD with that song, with the lyrics. There's also a musical score, if anybody would like to play it. Uh, there are about 400 copies, so please take a copy from, from the table and, and may that be a blessing to you. I've been a fan of James H. Brooks, probably the only one in existence for many years. This is the first time I've seen the nexus between Darby and Brooks. Can you elaborate on how close they were? Because uh, Brooks is a fantastic father of the faith for the dispensational movement. I may have to defer to other people uh, here in this audience. The, the knowledge that I have of Darby's connection with Brooks is based on just a few works. There isn't a great deal written um, about that, but Brooks said he had heard Darby preach. He'd invited Darby to preach in his church, heard him many times and with great profit, and, and paid tribute to Darby and to the Plymouth Brethren. And what was happening was that Darby and other members of the Plymouth Brethren were itinerating around the states, being invited into homes, being invited into conference centers uh, and into churches to, to read the scriptures and to, to talk about the Lord's coming. And I've just picked out pretty much everything I know 
about the connection between these guys I mentioned before and John Nelson Darby. There's not much written. You have to go digging. So if anybody has more information, please see my brother, and then please come and tell me where to find it. There, there are a couple of American uh, doctoral dissertations on Brooks, and I, I've read one of them, but I can't remember how much, if at all, that he talks about uh, Brooks's relationship with Darby. I know there's at least two doctoral dissertations that I have in my library on Brooks, mm -hmm. and I, of course, would have to get that information. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wilkinson, for your presentation. It was outstanding. I can't see you. Please. I'm, I'm please. over here. I'm <laughs> oh. <laughs> but thank you very Hi, much. Terry. It, was, it was just it was a delight. Um, but I do have one question uh, just for clarification in reference to Romans 11. I believe it's 23 where Paul says, if they continue not in unbelief. And the reason I ask the question is because of uh, Jews for Jesus and the proclamation of the gospel, yearning for Israel to return to the Lord. You you weren't suggesting they they too do not also need to be saved, were you? I, I, I because of your I, I believe absolutely that they're in God's plan and everything, but but I believe everyone must be born again. I believe everyone must be saved. Uh, you were not uh, suggesting that they were not in that in that need when. No, not at all. I mean, the, the priority for the Lord Jesus, what the Lord longs for right now be it Jew or Gentile, is that they come to faith in him, that they repent of their sin, come to faith, be part of his body, his bride, his, his church. But the Lord has a distinct sovereign purpose for an apostate nation, the apostate nation of Israel, that he will sovereignly intervene through his son. And they will look upon the one he appears, Zechariah 12, verse 10, the one he appears, and mourn for him. And then he'll open up, pour out that spirit of grace and supplication. But the gospel, that's the priority. Proclaim the gospel. Amen. And many of these pro-Israel ministries that I know certainly in Britain, I don't know about in, in the United States, many are not proclaiming the gospel. They're trying to be just friends of Israel and support financially and materially, which is great. It has its place, bringing the Jewish people back from the former Soviet Union. Those ministries have their place. But the priority, the urgency of the hour is tell every man be he Jew or Gentile, about the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is the Savior, he is the only hope for the world, and he's the only hope for Israel. Amen. Amen. See, I want to thank you for the beautiful presentation about John Nelson Darby. You might be interested to know that this organization was inspired mm -hmm. by reading about the Powers Court and the Albury conferences. Yes. And I was interested that you mentioned there were just 30 that gathered at that first one. Mm. We beat that by one. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, we have great respect for John Darby, and one of the things that uh, we've noticed is that w we claim that he is not the inventor of the pre-trib rapture, mm. but he is the popularizer yes. who came from England and did so much as you Describe. But I want to ask you a question that I'm sure you've been asked before. It's a little uh, uh, dubious question, but I've been asked this many times, and both Tommy and I and others have tried to answer this in print, and that is the question about Margaret MacDonald. Mm -hmm. Have you, in your copious uh, research, found any indication that Darby had any uh, communication with her or in any way received any of his teaching from Margaret MacDonald's vision. Thank you very much. Um, I was certainly very aware of the influence of Powers Court and Albury, having read um, from the pre-trib site and, and in your work as well. So uh, it was just lovely to be able to talk about Powers Court and Albury and um, the connection between Darby and Margaret MacDonald. Those that want to attack the doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture, want to go to Derby and want to make a link, as Dr. LaHaye said, with this young Scottish girl called Margaret MacDonald, who was there up in Port Glasgow, um, in, in the south of Scotland. And around 1830, reports were coming out of Scotland that the Holy Spirit was being poured out, that there were miracles, there were signs and wonders, people were speaking in tongues and prophesying. And a lot of the the Ferrari centered around this young girl, Margaret MacDonald. 
and many English clergymen went up to Scotland to investigate. Is this the Holy Spirit? Is this a genuine work of God? Is this an end times revival? And Derby was sent on behalf of the brethren up to Scotland to check this out. And you can read in my book, For Zion's Sake, you, you can just read about this in a lot more detail, but I'll just try and be very brief. Margaret MacDonald gave a prophetic or a so-called prophetic utterance in which she talked about a kind of rapture. She talked about the Antichrist and the tribulation. Um, and many people want to say, people like Dave McPherson, um, who wrote a book called The Incredible Cover-Up, and he's the main guy that led this uh, false and scurrilous accusation against Derby that he, he got his doctrine of the rapture from this Scottish girl. Um, forgot where I was going there. But Derby went up and he heard what was being said and what was being uttered in these meetings. And all you have to do is read what Margaret MacDonald, this Scottish girl, said. You cannot, it is not possible except if you have a stubborn heart and a, and a stiff neck. It is not possible to find a pre-trib rapture position in what Margaret MacDonald said. It is so confusing what she said. It is either a partial rapture or a post-tribulation rapture position that's coming out of this utterance. Um, now, Darby went up, he heard Margaret MacDonald. I don't think he heard that specific um, so-called utterance but he was in these meetings and he wrote a report and said this is not the Holy Spirit this is not from God this is not a genuine tongue and he wrote um, an essay called The Irrationalism of Infidelity there, get your, your tongue around that one The Irrationalism of Infidelity which was published in 1853 you can get hold of that I refer to that in the book where he talks about his visit to Scotland and said, this is not of the Lord. He was emphatic, and the brethren were emphatic. They distanced themselves from Margaret MacDonald. One person who was more persuaded by her was a man I mentioned very briefly called Edward Irving. And Edward Irving is the man who really is connected with Margaret MacDonald, not John Nelson Darby. In the appendix of the book, you can read what Margaret MacDonald said in full. You can judge for yourself. Any reasonable person reading that will not conclude this is a pre-trib rapture. It's just the enemy stirring up trouble, trying to make associations that are simply not there. They don't stand. And if you just do a little bit of research, you find out. You find out the truth. Any more questions? Also, the Irvinites were historicists, and there are broader charges that the Irvinite movement and even Edward Irving himself, uh, you know, developed a preacher of rapture, and that's just totally wrong. Uh, I'm doing a, a doctoral dissertation on it, and uh, there's no evidence whatsoever. Now, mm -hmm. what the Irvinites did believe in, that they were right near the second coming of Christ, because the 1,260 days within the historicist framework uh, had finished the year of the French Revolution, according to them. Mm. And therefore, the Lord's coming was upon us. And so they use a lot of imminency, and they use rapture passages to refer to the second coming. But it's very clear, uh, I've looked up uh, in the Morning Watch, which was their uh, journal, I've looked up, uh, all, it's un, a little under 200 references to uh, these, and every one of them is a reference to the Second Coming. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what they're talking about within the historicist framework. And so only a person who is not trying to understand the context of these teachings, this is why, probably why this developed later and wasn't an issue at the time when it came out, uh, because none of the Irvinites ever claimed that Darby uh, got the rapture from them, because they, didn't, they never believed it. 
Mm. So how can, how can you uh, get something from some, someone who never believed it? And so, it, you know, I'm documenting in my dissertation that you, the Irvinites never believed in a preacher of rapture, and they never believed, uh, and Edward Irving never believed in that. But what people do is they pull quotes out about the second coming and say that these are rapture statements mm -hmm. when understood within the historicist interpretive framework mm -hmm. they make sense but mm -hmm. if you were looking at them from a futurist which they were not at this point mm -hmm. you know then uh, people can sometimes make that argument but in their original context and the original meaning that they were not pre-trib. Dr. Ice just to, to add one point I mean what what people do um, with Derby is what they do with Dr. LaHaye and, and yourself and, and, and the scholars here. They don't take your word for it. If you read Darby's writings, one of the things you'll find, and this is what scholars have really struggled with, he has very few sources, very few footnotes, very few people are mentioned in his writings. He was very well read, but his testimony was that he got the doctrine of the rapture, the understanding of the catching away of the bride at any moment, from the scriptures. Now that's Dr. LaHaye's testimony, that's Dr. Ice's testimony, that's my testimony, that's your testimony. If we've got our understanding from any secondary source, we've got a shaky foundation. But it's from the scriptures, and people won't accept that. There's got to be an influence. Somebody who's written so much must have been influenced by another scholar or another movement. Darby's testimony, I believe it, because I believe him was that he got it from, remember that horse riding accident when for three months he just locked himself away and studied the scriptures and prayed, the Lord touched his heart and opened up the word of God. There was no new revelation, but to him it was, it was new because he understood there was a dispensation to come. Jesus could come for the church at any moment, but he was returning to be king upon the earth. Yeah, and on top of that, you're, he's right in the middle of the shift among evangelicals from yes. historicism to futurism. Yes, that's right. In other words, you can support and show the logic of his thinking mm -hmm. within his own writings to support this. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you want to argue the Irvinites or Mark McDonald held a preacher of rapture, they don't have the surrounding theological mm -hmm. support or rationale. In other words, it would be something that would be inconsistent with what they generally taught. And uh, so, you know, in, in giving certainly the benefit of the doubt to one's own testimony, and, and Darby was certainly not known to be a liar. Now, I know that, you know, it's kind of like today's politics where, you know, George W. Bush and Sarah Palin and people like that, uh, certain people build a parallel universe for these people and uh, make a, uh, you know, build a character that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm you know, that uh, said that they didn't know where Africa was or they uh, could see Russia from their front porch. You know, these are things that these people never said. And uh, they become, uh, be you know, believed because of the media and stuff like that. And that's basically the same kind of, of uh, misstatement that you have going on, mm -hmm. you know, in, in this area as well. Mm -hmm. Beca uh, and one of the reasons that pre-tribbers uh, have not gotten into defending our historical roots is because we were too busy teaching the Bible. <laughs> we, the, the pre-trib rapture movement is a Bible study movement. And even George Ladd and people that oppose us admit this, that it was the greatest Bible study movement in Europe in the 1800s mm -hmm. that this came out of. And it's because they didn't set out to study even eschatology. They just started studying the Bible mm -hmm. inductively and the whole Bible, and out of it came dispensationalism because they had to put it all together, and out came pre-tribulationalism and these other things. Mm -hmm. And the same is true in the United States about 50 years later. The post-Civil War Bible study movement that began uh, as evidence through the Niagara conferences and these other conferences, which produced Bible colleges and seminaries like Dallas Theological Seminary, uh, were Bible study movements. 
And because we taught the whole Bible verse by verse, we had to deal with eschatology, mm -hmm. which is about, you know, almost 30% of the Bible. And so it's out of that framework that our overall movement came. And now we're seeing in the postmodern context a move away from Bible study. In other words, away from inductive Bible study to hot flash I big ideas that they want to impose on the text. Mm -hmm. And in other words, that's called idealism. And that's what you always get when you move away from an inductive approach to the Bible is you get, I like to call them hot flash big ideas. In other words, they're idealism that, mm -hmm. that comes. And so many ideas are reactions to what your parents taught and your parents, you know, got saved through reading the late great planet Earth and all that stuff, and so we're not going to believe like mom and dad. And, you know, there's some of that going on, you know, just a reaction to what mom and dad uh, believed or, you know, the older generation because they're going to do something new and all this kind of stuff. And if you're going to get too new, you're going to end up in apostasy. Any other questions or comments? Okay. I, I was just wondering, um, kind of a postscript comment and sort of asking you too, being in Manchester, my observations in Britain is that among the brethren, Plymouth brethren today, as we call them Plymouth brethren, <laughs> Uh, it's about 50% that still hold to Darbyism. Would you agree with me? And what is your observation as to why so many uh, brethren churches have turned away from the uh, clearly dispensational view? I don't know. Um, my, my background is not brethren. Um, I've been invited this year to several brethren conferences and they've been very much um, proclaiming the dispensationalist message, the pre-trib rapture in particular. Um, I think just to give a more broad and general answer, the church in, in Britain is in great decline. It's not just the brethren, um, be it the Pentecostals or the Baptists or whoever, we are in a desperate, desperate state. And those who hold a pre-trib position are in an increasingly small minority. We are a small church, but we are quite unique. There are not many churches where everybody believes in the pre-trib rapture of, uh, of the church, of the bride of Christ. And so we get tremendous opposition. As small and as insignificant as we are, we get tremendous opposition. The, the majority view within the pro-Israel, if you like, camp is post-tribulationism. That we are the ones who are going to bring Israel through. We're going to stand against Antichrist. We've got to persevere, and only those who persevere to the end will be saved. And I could tell you some horror stories of what senior evangelical leaders are teaching uh, in Britain today. So I think that the, the decline in, in brethrenism is just a symptom of a, a much broader decline in the state of the church full stop. Um, but we're, we're praying. We feel that maybe the Lord is beginning to stir and provoke, again, getting the brethren to think back to their roots, where they came from, what it was that the Lord commissioned them to do back in the early uh, 19th century in, in particular. So it's difficult times, but that's what the Scripture says. It will be, it will be difficult. I'm sorry I can't give you any more specific uh, than that uh, regarding the brethren. Uh, great uh, presentation, great song also, by the way. I have a question. Three, three or four times in your presentation and a couple times that you've spoke, you mentioned about the church, the bride of Christ. Could you relate that term, the church, the bride of Christ, to um, in Revelation 21, uh, 2, 9, and 10, it also, you know, John has shown the bride, the lamb's wife, uh, which is the New Jerusalem. Could you please relate how the the bride, the church, is is the bride, the new city that came down from heaven, the Lamb's wife? 
Well, I may need some help here. That's, uh, I think you've gathered by now I'm not very concise in my answers, so I could be here for, t for 10 minutes. Uh, maybe Tom then could help or some other scholar here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I would take it as a reference. In other words, it's the same metaphor of the bride, but it's applied to two different things. One, to the body of Christ, and secondly... Uh, when it comes down from heaven, it's saying that the new Jerusalem is dressed as a bride. What does that mean? Well, women, cover your ears. Uh, it means that on wedding day, you know, a woman is as pretty as she's going to be. In other words, she spends all day getting fixed up. <laughs> and, and so as a bride, I think is an idiom there for maximum beauty. In other words, as beautiful as it can be. And th I think that's how it is used in that context. Now you see why I didn't answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> He's smart enough to know. Uh, when to pass the book. Yes. Yep. But th that's how I understand that passage. Uh, some people try to equate them there and I think that's wrong but I was just trying to quote specifically when it says I'll show you the bride comma the lamb's wife and right. I didn't know if that was you know you're, oh, but that's you're a saying different that's a different verse than I had in mind okay yeah, yeah that's 21 9 yeah well I, I think that one is a reference to uh, yeah that's so the, what, the it wouldn't church. have been a metaphor that would have actually been yeah. I will show you you know the new Jerusalem the bride the lamb's wife so mm -hmm. okay the only reason I, I'm up on that particular point is because we had a discussion and a study on that uh, a while back at church. Um, if you, if you, of course, you you understand that the the verses uh, are, were not numbered when, when, when uh, John wrote them, and of course the chapter divisions were not there. So what we had was a body of text, and when you see John, when when he says the angel, I believe it is, says, you know, behold the. Uh, uh, it would, do you want to see the, the, the bride? And then immediately in the next verse, he says something to the effect about looking at Jerusalem and so forth. Now, if you'll read on, he begins to describe. If you're panning in, if we're doing this as a movie, if you're panning in from the universe and coming down to the earth, and you're, if you'll read it, it's like that. It's beautiful. It's just like a Hollywood script. And it just comes right in, and you'll follow those verses along through those passages on into 22, then he says, at that point in 22-something, wherever, he says, and then he presents the bride. So when he, when he begins, when he says, do you want to see the bride? And then he says, here's the new Jerusalem. He's talking about the new Jerusalem. He's not talking about anything else. Staying within the conduct, context of the scripture and staying within what's taking place. And then he follows along and he describes the new Jerusalem immaculately, beautifully. And you go all the way into 22 where he says, and here's the bride. So you're getting this long shot view. You're coming, it's beautiful when you study it. It's, it's incredible. Uh, Dr. Saint, do you have a comment? You used to put me on the spot in class. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> well, basically, I take it that the church is the bride of Christ, obviously. In the Old Testament, Israel is called the wife. And I take it that here... You have the body of the redeemed, and it's, it's just called the wife, not meaning the church is excluded. I think the church is included in this. So I think he has the body of the redeemed, because you have both Israel and the church included, 12 apostles, 12 tribes of Israel. So I think you're right, Tommy. I think that's like you have two senses. Thank you. Yeah, you could easily add to that. Uh, Revelation 21 begins, I saw a new heavens and a new earth. Uh, that's a direct quotation from Isaiah. So um, I think we ought to be careful here. Uh, the overall wife of the Lord are going to be all believers, Jew and Gentile. Amen. Israel thanks you. God bless you, Tommy. <laughs> Thank you, David. That's why we have you on the front row. <laughs> Excuse me, but uh, I've thought a lot about the relationship of Christ in the church. And for most of us, for me, it was uh, uh, next July, it'll be 62 years ago 
that I saw the most beautiful woman in the world. Mm. And we're on our way immediately after this conference to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where I'm going to perform the most expensive wedding in my entire ministry of 61 years. Uh, and I compare that to my own wedding that we paid for ourselves. It cost us $275. So you know how extravagant an experience. But I, I appreciate what you said about the bride, or what Tommy said, being the most beautiful. And, uh, but she gets more beautiful as time goes on. And as you think of it, uh, I, I've tried to relate it to the relationship that Christ has to the Jews, to, to Israel. And I have great respect for that, and, and I love the way you presented it to clearly today. But our relationship is a little different. Hmm. And, you know, I was taught, and I'm sure many of you were, that you, you, when the plain sense of Scripture makes common sense, you seek no other sense. Well, I find that the picture of the bride and the relationship with the groom and so on, it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. I think there's a more beautiful message behind that, that Christ will have his relationship as the king sitting on the throne of David, leading the children of Israel and the world from Jerusalem. That's one relationship. But I also think we in the body of Christ will have a different relationship and the neat thing about it is, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Lord. I don't have to know a lot of answers about that. I'm going to be with Jesus, and all of you will be with me. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will, uh, our eternal future, when we rule and reign with Christ, I, I can't, can't quite understand all of that when I look at the population at the end of the tribulation. I mean, it's going to be pretty grim. There will be more of us than them that we're <laughs> ruling over. I just put all that in the hands of God, but mm -hmm. we're going to be in a special category. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And all of you who love the woman that said yes many years ago, like me, you can identify with this, that you can trust her and she can trust you. And we're going to trust him forever mm -hmm. and ever mm -hmm. and ever. Mm -hmm.